Good evening, everybody. We will be starting here shortly. We're going to wait just a few more minutes for uh, give everybody time to, to log on. This is Arabella Capital, and the webinar we'll be presenting today is Investing in Uncertain Times. So again, welcome, and uh, we're going to give everybody a couple more minutes. Also, we do want to mention earlier that this, you know, just so everyone on this webinar is recorded. So we are going to send out everyone that registered will get a copy of the recorded webinar to review. Those of you just joining, welcome. And we are waiting just a couple of more, more minutes for any stragglers that uh, are wanting to attend the webinar tonight. And as uh, Mr. Adam Whitmire has advised, we are recording and a recorded call will be sent out to all registered attendees. Yeah, and Billy, we can go ahead and get started if you want. I think we're good. All right. Again, everybody, welcome to Arabella Capital's uh, presentation of Investing in Uncertain Times. We do have a, a quick disclaimer to read real fast before we, we get started. Um, so this is not an offer to sell nor solicitation of an offer to purchase uh, securities. Uh, the strategies mentioned in the presentation may not be appropriate for everyone. Past performance, not guaranteed of future results. Uh, consult your professionals, accountants, tax attorneys, have tax advisors and, and discuss your specific situation for your investing needs. Uh, you will see a, legal full, a full legal disclaimer at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let's uh, introduce our, our two panelists tonight. First one, uh, Adam Whitmire, who holds his CCIM. He is the founder and uh, and secretary of Arabella Capital LLC. So Adam is a third generation investor developer, 18 years of real estate experience in both single family and multifamily, including land development and new construction projects. Uh, again, I did mention that he holds his CCIM designation. Uh, Adam has also held other licenses in real estate security six, 26, 63, and 65, and insurance license, licenses. Rob Fuller is founder, also founder of Arabella Capital and has uh, analyzed and closed, renovated and placed tenants and managed over 350 properties in five states. Uh, he's got a wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, he's over 11 years of experience in the real estate industry, operating those single family, multifamily properties. Also includes land development, new construction projects, including one that he is currently working one out in Colorado Springs that uh, has 218 lots, over 825 acres, and then also six homes that are being built on an infill lot in Northern California. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rob and Adam. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate you guys for spending some time with us. We're going to share something that we feel like is important to us and we feel like some of the knowledge and the information is going to be important to you guys. We, this is what we do full time is real estate. I've been in the real estate business I'm all full time, I guess about 18 years. Rob's been in 10, 12, you know, plus years as well, full time in, in the real estate business. And I'm actually kind of third generation, as Billy said, grew up in it, been around a lot a lot um, of home building, a lot of subdivision development, apartment construction as well. So we're going to share something with you guys that's really, it's kind of a new, really a new asset class. And just in this past decade, since the last downturn, uh, I'm sure a lot of you may already be aware that single family rental properties have, since this last recession became a new asset class uh, targeted by Wall Street, by institutional investors, hedge funds, and, and it's, it's been really been re developing in a very interesting way. So what this webinar is going to be about tonight is, is, some, is 
going to be us sharing with you what we found out during COVID really during this really challenging or volatile time in our economy. Uh, so we're going to show you some asset classes that have surprised us and that have outperformed. And so this is going to, we're going to introduce you if you're not already familiar with a concept called build to rent. So back in, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and a little bit of history first. Back in 2010, we really kind of heavily dove into single family rentals because that was the place to be at the time. That's the great opportunities and the housing market was so undervalued. Cash flow is everywhere, potential appreciation and equity. And I think everyone that purchased properties back then, knowing what they know now, wish they'd purchased a lot more of them. And that was some of the, the wisdom that a lot of the hedge funds that saw coming. So anyway, what happened that that developed out in, in the last few years, as the recession, as the market, you know, developed and, and it went from a buyer's market to a seller's market. And you saw a lot of the buyers that were purchasing those single family rentals, you know, pulled out. And many of them went to secondary and tertiary markets chasing yield. And what we did at that time, we decided to stay in the, in the Southeast and in, in the Atlanta market primarily. We knew it was a seller's market, but we decided, okay, we're not going to be a buyer anymore. We're going to be a seller. Because you typically want to buy in a buyer's market and sell in a seller's market, right? So we decided we're going to create more inventory. So let's go back to home building, which is a lot of my background was in uh, new construction. And so we decided to focus on building homes. As we were this, what we were discovering as we we're looking for opportunities in the home building business, we discovered that land is the most important piece. If you can get the land and if you can get the lots, and that then you can kind of control the destiny of what happens with that property. So as uh, Rob and Billy and I and our team transitioned from single family rental properties over to land development and home building, uh, a lot of the institutional buyers, we, I guess, uh, did over a thousand transactions selling properties to institutional buyers. A lot of them came back to us and said, look, we're having a hard time getting rentals. We want, we want to build the rent. Can you get us rentals in your neighborhoods or can you, you know, make these rental neighborhoods? So we, we looked at that, we researched it and we found a tremendous opportunity. Let me give you some more insight on this. Okay. What, uh, your, Institutional Wall Street funds have purchased over 400,000 single family homes in the last eight years. Okay, and distressed sales, they were mostly buying distress. Those distressed sales dropped from 49% in 2009 to 2% 2 in 2019. So, so when the inventory you're purchasing from goes from 49% down to 2% and you still have money to spend, you have a problem. And so at that point, everyone was looking at build to rent. And so they're like, okay, well, now we can build more inventory that we can invest in and have more rentals. And as a matter of fact, we like these newer homes anyway, because these are more like A-class rentals that have lower maintenance cost. And the new construction rentals nationally grow and had um, higher rent growth. They were growing at like four and a half percent, whereas multifamily is growing at three percent. They had lower turnover turnover rates, tenants stayed longer. So for all intents and purposes, it looked like a, uh, a great investment. They were performing well, even better than a lot of their existing portfolio. So what happened over the last two years, new construction rentals have doubled year over year. You have a lot of groups, uh, Lennar, Toll Brothers, uh, DR Horton, everybody, a lot of your national builders are getting into build to rent space. And this is kind of what was happening before COVID. This is what was happening up until, you know, last year and then at the beginning of this year until things started to change. Okay, so build, so if you look at this for the first time in our nation's history, household rental household formations have outpaced home ownership formations. This is from Fannie Mae. Look at this, 52% versus 43%. So Three out of five living generations today are either considering or uh, considering or preferring renting a home. You know, what, you know what happened. I think prior to the last recession, you know, home ownership was the American dream. So that dream died for a lot of people during the last recession, and now 
a lot of people are preferring to rent. So renting has been strong. And the millennial, uh, the demographic and the demand for rentals has been continuing to grow. And, you know, now millennials are, you know, turning 40 and they're, some of them are buying homes, a lot of them are renting. And so up until this year, up until COVID having happened, the, the rental outlook was very strong and single family homes was a new thing, right? Here's, here's some more data. This is the single family rental market index. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before I go into this, this is really interesting. Going in to this year, into 2020, you know, all, every, all the institutional buyers, including us and a lot of people in the market, their thesis and their idea that, hey, we feel like these single family rentals are going to perform better. We think they're going to do well over time. And we think, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the best thing out there and this, where there's going to be high demand. And that was proven to be true during the pandemic because we saw single family rentals perform really well, particularly new construction, single family rentals. Even in our portfolio, we do single family and multifamily, you know, our multifamily struggled a little bit, but it's now coming back and doing well. Our single, single family portfolios were outperforming our uh, multifamily and our new construction, single family properties were even doing better even than the existing single family. But look at what this study, and this is a study, um, a lot of the source came from John Burns Consulting. It's a, a consulting company in the housing industry and in the construction, and just in, and we're in the real estate industry in general. But if you look at this, the single family rental market index, okay? So single family rental market index rose sharply to 76%, 76 out of 100 in the second quarter of this year. What happened going into the second quarter of this year? Well, we were all sheltering in place. Right, came March and April, everybody sitting at home can't go anywhere. As soon as people were allowed to leave their house, because remember a lot, a lot of unemployment, a lot of people working from home now, stuck at home, working out of whatever space they have to deal with, with the kids, can't go to the gym to work out. So as soon as people are allowed to leave their home, we started to see a boom in single family sales. The single family rental market rose sharply. Okay, and so and what happened, people started looking for, um, they wanted a place where they could have an office at home and more space. They wanted to have a gym at home. They're going to be stuck at home. They wanted to have better accommodations and more accommodations, right? And then another interesting thing started happening. Um, if you think about it, so density and um, social distancing don't go well together. So people started get, uh, fleeing the high density areas and heading for the suburbs. So you had this ex huge explosion in the suburbs. So look at this, um, national median rent right now, which is 4% below entry level housing mortgages. It's cheaper to rent nationwide right now than it is to buy a house, even with the interest, interest rates. So leasing activity, is slight is, is was a lot strong is stronger than expected occupancy rates are very high 96 percent occupancy for these properties in 2020 up from 95 percent in the first quarter of 2020 so going through this pandemic occupancy actually went up in single family homes uh, leasing activity went up home ownership went up you know what went down during this period of time new home construction um, builders laying off a lot of employees, a lot of unemployment. But look at this: every one of these, uh, every one of these indexes are up for single-family homes. So, single-family performed so well. And, and Rob, you'll have to, um, you'll have to jog my memory. There's a couple different companies. I think it wasn't J.P. Morgan. I know the Koch brothers and some other companies during the pandemic. As people were seeing this, they saw retail was struggling, hospitality was struggling, a lot of mark areas were struggling. Single-family was booming. And so a lot of capital, hundreds of millions of dollars during the pandemic went into single family homes. And we want to share this with you guys because not everybody knows this. And a lot of that, not everybody saw this data and not everybody was following this data. So we want to share it. We want to get this out there. We want to share it with everyone. And so they can, so we can all take part and benefit from what's happening in the market today. So if you so this, this demand creates opportunities for investors, look at the 10 year increase in single family rentals versus multifamily rentals. 
Single family rentals, 10 year increase of 31%. Multi family, family 14%. Guys, we love multi family. We love seeing, we have a, we have a portfolio. And I'm just telling you what we're seeing. And this is what's coming back. Um, this is from the census. Interesting data that we're finding as we're surveying the landscape, trying to figure out where do we invest? Where do we put our capital? You know, we were one of the groups that were going into this, this, um, this pandemic, you know, we were, I think every, over the last 10 years, we had such high growth. Everybody was holding their breath, waiting for the economy to come down, waiting for the next crash or the next recession. And, you know, everybody was holding their breath. And so looking at that, we thought, well, let's just position ourselves well with housing because housing is very resilient. People have to have a place to live. <clears throat> Little did we know that we were the next downturn. We were going to go into a pandemic that was going to force people out into the suburbs and into, uh, uh, you know, into single family homes. So here's some of the information. Here's some of the data that we found in managing these portfolios. Median, uh, the, the lease up is like we get nine units per month per uh, per month. This is in a subdivision. We can go into a subdivision, lease up nine summer subdivisions, leasing up five to 20 properties per month. So lease up is very high. It's very strong. Occupancy is very strong. Um, rent premiums are a lot higher. We're seeing 15 to 30% above um, equal sized apartments. Cap rates for leased and managed products. You know, a lot of apartments we see five cap, we're seeing five caps or less. And at the same time, we're seeing six caps on single family detached. Those cap rates are actually gonna to start to fall now that the, the single family mark um, asset class has really kind of proved, proven itself well, has proven itself out during this, um, these last several months during the pandemic to be, to do well and very strong, be very strong. And so those cap rates are going, falling a little bit. Well, what we're gonna do is um, toward the end of this, we're gonna share you some of the deals that we're involved in right now and what's actually happening and and what's going on and, and it's it's absolutely amazing really if you think about there's so much home buying i think everyone that knows a realtor or if you know someone you know if you're selling properties it's just a boom it's booming right now some of the builders that we've heard from this is the the, the best it's ever been in their career but i want to show you this i took a snapshot of this today this is these are housing starts in the united states right <clears throat> august 2020 we're at a million housing starts, right? So if you go back and you look at this graph, these gray lines, these are recessions. Here's 2000, September 2008. See this is a big drop. This is where this is where new housing starts. So right here, so you got the it's way up here, 1.8 million housing starts, and then it drops to like less than half a million. And if you look as the economy was growing, and unemployment was going back down, incomes were coming back up just about every indicator, every economic indicator across the board was going up and went back up to really back up to the pre-recession numbers, except for housing. Why does housing not, you know, why is it less than half and still today less than half, but you saw this is for 12, 2014, 2016, the economy was strong right here. You're way below half because what happened, banks no longer lend money to, uh, to mom and pops to develop land. And so you can't develop land. You can't get lots. And if you can't get lots, homeowners can't build homes. So our student home builders, so all the nationals and the big guys that were building homes, all they bought up all the existing lots, which we call legacy lots, but then there was nothing else. And so they're having a hard time. So it's really expensive. So what you're seeing is not a lot of entry level housing in the market. What you're seeing are homes that are priced from three to 500,000. That's what's been coming out of the ground once those legacy lots were purchased. And this is what we found out as we dove in back into new construction, try to figure out where does, where's, where's the opportunity? Where does our capital need to go? And this is what we found out. And if you look, you can go all the way out, see this big drop out toward the end, toward August, that's COVID. That is a V-shaped recovery for the housing market, if I've ever seen one. See that? During this whole period of time that we're not building houses, um, people are household formation is still happening. Homes, people are still aging, having babies and growing during that whole period of time. So you have a long stretch, a period where there's 
no new construction at all, and then very little new construction. And, but yet um, households are growing. And so, we're, so once the new construction really starts to come back really hard, you know, in 2018, 17, 18, 19, last, you know, really three, two, three, maybe four years coming back really hard, now we can see, okay, people are buying, but we're running its issue. We're running out of lots. And then the pandemic happened and it slows down. And, 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 and that's where we're at now. So ultimately, right now, we're in a situation which most of the markets across the country, your, all your primary markets, a lot of your markets have, there's a supply and demand issue. You've got a lot of housing demand, not a lot of supply. That creates opportunity for us. So what we do is we go into markets and we analyze and try to figure out which markets have the highest housing demand. So I'm going to show you one market. I'm going to talk about Atlanta right now because we're our head, you know, we're based out of Atlanta and we've got projects in the Southeast. We feel like, and not feel like, in other words, the data, we can say it's our opinion, but it's not, it's really the data. That is telling us that uh, we're picking up, the Southeast is capturing so much inward migration right now. And this was prior to COVID, prior to, you know, people fleeing a lot of the big cities. And we're picking up a lot of migration and we were poised to have pick up the largest amount of migra migration into the Southeast um, over the entire country. The Southeast region is going to pick up the most. And there's a lot of reasons, you know, weather, affordability, um, a lot of it has to do with affordability and weather and, and people like the beaches and such in Florida. But right now, just in Atlanta, in the city of Atlanta, 700 individuals per week are moving into Atlanta. And that, and that number continues to grow. So this basically creates a problem. If you look right here, again, these numbers, this is last year's numbers. This is prior to COVID. It was already, here's your, the blue, this is your total demand for homes. And the red, this is what was under construction. And over on the other side, the, this is like this 30,000 units. This is rental demand. And then rental units under construction. So there's a big disparity. There was already a supply and demand issue. This was prior to COVID. That means this, you know, it was already, bad, COVID slowed down production of homes and yet increased demand for homes. Now we have a real problem. So you're, we're seeing home prices skyrocket. We're seeing multiple offers above list price. We put homes on the market right now and we get multiple offers immediately, a lot of love above list price. Anyone, any investor, flipper, home builder that had properties and homes to sell right now is selling them all or has sold them all. Atlanta, another reason now, again, that's just short, that's short term and that's what's happening right now. Well, it's short and midterm. It's going to carry out for a while, but that's not the only reason we like this market. And any market's got to have other reasons. One of the biggest ones is job diversification. This is the fastest, the fourth fasting, fastest growing MSA in the country. Third, most Fortune 500 com, uh, headquarters out of Atlanta. So there's a lot of job diversity, most of, fourth most affordable city. Uh, you look at this graph, employment growth, seven year growth, population growth is high, income growth is high, rent growth is high, and home values are high. Again, guys, this, these stats, this is prior to COVID, this is prior to the boom that's happening right now, it's unbelievable. So here's, when we started to position ourselves, we wanted to start off buying land because we can control the land, we can control the destiny of that. So we would purchase the land, do a financial analysis, market analysis, and to determine what, you know, what's a good tract of land and what, what are the good spots. And so we picked up a number of tracts on the north side of Atlanta and on the south side of Atlanta. And we started working those, getting them entitled, getting the land developed. And all this, we did all this prior to this big boom that we're having right now. And I'm gonna share with you as we go through and talk about what we're doing in our strategy and, and again, this is however you do it. This is an asset class that you cannot ignore and that you, that we feel like is one of the best places to invest right now for growth, capital preservation, and, and just, um, you know, it's just, it, just, just stability. It's done. It's, it did exactly what we thought it was going to do, but it did it, it did it better. Right, and it was in a, a much more difficult scenario. We could have never imagined what happened was going to happen. And so, going into here, we put together a management team. Our management team has developed over three thousand lots. We've got over seven or eight seven hundred in the pipeline. 
Um, we've done over 65 million at SFR. And so we put together a fantastically experienced team and I'll talk about them a little bit more. But here's the three steps, basically. Having the right team, <clears throat> our target metrics. We were on most of these developments. We were looking at two plus multiples, had to be above a 30 IRR, um, minimum margin 15 to 20%. Most of the margins, um, the, most of the, excuse me, the IRRs, again, that was a minimum 30 to 40% is what we're targeting. This is what we're seeing in the development side. And, and margins, it's a funny thing is um, when you're in going from a, a single family turnkey property where you're talking about return on investment and what's your ROI, as opposed to using a margin on a home build, a 15 to 20% margin is way higher than a 15 to 20% ROI on a property that you're flipping. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So step number two in our strategy was to have these in buyer relationships. We wanted to have a buyer's list going into it because one of the benefits of having, uh, having this type, you know, single family or new construction build to rent properties was there was a lot of institutional buyers ready to take those properties down. And so we acquired and put together a list of these buyers and a lot of them were people that we sold to in the past anyway. But let me tell you about my favorite part, step three. Okay, so remember going back, remember when I told you that most of the new construction of, new, of newly developed lots was typically around three to 500,000 in a lot of these markets? So basically the entry level housing got skipped your new entry level housing jumped up to like $300,000. So people had to rent. So when you get out and start off, you need to rent. And so you can get up to four to three, you know, 300,000 plus home, a three to $400,000 house. So basically what happened was um, with the build to rent allows us now to build affordable housing. It allows us to build entry level housing again. That means we're building houses under 300,000 in the twos. First of all, that is the fastest absorbing price point in uh, just across the board. Any market you go to, it's the very high absorption rates. And every, every market that we've an analyzed, underwritten, and looked at, very high absorption rates. Now, it's a lot easier to rent or lease a house than it is to sell a house. So if home sales had really high absorption in the, when you're building homes in the twos, what do you think happened with rental? you're building brand new houses and renting them out. That's where we had those really high lease up numbers. Okay. But look, here's with all the different exit strategies, it's a lot less risky for us to do this build to rent strategy than it is to try to build lots for DR Horton or Lennar or something, you know, just that kind of model. It's very risky, you know? So with, with this model, we always underwrite focusing on, taking it all the way to the end. In other words, we're going to get this tract of land. We're going to develop it. We're going to build the houses. We're going to lease it up. And their options at that point are to sell it or to rent it out and refinance and keep it. Now we can actually sell these projects at any point in time we want. We can either, we can sell it once we get it entitled and get it permitted, we can sell it or we can do it or we can develop the lots and then we can sell it or we can build the houses and then we can sell it or we can lease it up and then we can sell it or we can refinance and hold on to it. This is what sold us on this build to rent model. And let me, let me give you a specific example. We've got a project right now in Atlanta. It's, uh, you know, it's like 105, 108 units. Then, so we're taking this puppy all the way to the finish line, titled the land, got it permitted. And so we're, our plan is to develop it and go vertical, build it out, lease it up, once it's performing, we were just going to sell it to one of these environs like we talked about. So right bef before we closed on the land, as we were, we were vetting out, you know, some different property management companies for this particular project. One of our comps was an apartment complex near this. And once they found out that we had this deal, they're like, hey, would you guys sell this? We would love to buy this deal because you have all these three and four bedrooms. We're just one and twos. They sent us an LOI. And they, so now we have an LOI that we can sell at, after performing after Lisa, we also ended up with an LOI to sell it at CO. That means once we build it and it has a certificate of occupancy, we can turn around and sell it. We don't have to lease it up. And then we got an LOI, guys, we got an LOI this week to buy it as is. And then they'll pay us to develop it. 
And so we said, no, nah, we don't want to do that because we're going to lose too much money because the further we take it out, the more we make. So we gave them a ridiculous price and we said, look, well, it's not completely ridiculous. It was still within, within the market. It kept them still within the market value of the lots, but it allowed us to make the same amount of money we were going to make by developing it if they took it um, to make that money right now. And ultimately what happened was they accepted our offer. They gave us a full price offer to buy this right, you know, before it's even developed. So we're selling the land for the same profit, for pretty much the same profit we were going to get for developing it and they're going to pay us to develop it. So, so again, what we anticipated and thought would happen is what happened. And, and it's not just to us. There's, there's a handful of guys doing this. And this has just been, is the risk reward ratio here is fantastic. And so this is our focus and this is our strategy. And this is why we're raising this fund because we found this unbelievable opportunity and it's, you know, we thought it was going to be good. It's turned out so far to be great. This is, well, let me get, this is some, some highlights on our management team going into this. We wanted to make sure that we had the right players, right? So Rob and I went out and we found, Wayne Clark, 47 years in development. Actually, I've known Wayne Clark for a long time, uh, you know, years and years ago. And we're from the same hometown in Gainesville, Georgia, up on Lake Lanier. And my mother actually used to babysit his kids. So he's been a developer. He's been around a long time, almost five decades of development. Just in the last couple of decades, he developed 35 subdivisions. And so we, part, we partnered up and he's handling a lot of the development. We've got Joe Beasley, him and I have been partnered for about five years. Joe is a multifamily operator. He's got, you know, close to around 2,400 units in Atlanta right now. Last month was his 49th year in the business. And he's managed and owned and operated over 12,000 units. Fantastic gentlemen. We've got Tim House and Billy, uh, land developer. We've got operations people. This is more of our executive team. We've got, you know, just, just a fantastic group of people. Joe, uh, you know, we had, had some, you know, great experience with multifamily last, last year, cap rates dropped so much. We, you know, our more for the multifamily portfolio has done really well. We're going to talk about multifamily in a different presentation. We wanted to get this out first because this was the most exciting thing. This is what was going on. Again, this is some of Wayne Clark's developments, just recent developments. Rob and I, some of our um, acquisitions and projects that we've been working on over the last several years. Joe Beasley, um, don't, don't look at those IRRs and those returns. We're going to save those for the multifamily um, presentation. These are some of our investors that probably invested with us the longest, and they gave us um, uh, raving reviews. Um, John's had over $18 million with us. And Jay put $3 million with us. These guys are professional heavy hitters. And we've got a number of investors. We just wanted to throw a couple of them. These are probably some of our longer ones. This, uh, we are raising a fund. Again, in this particular fund, though, it, it is for accredited investors. We still want you to call us anyway. And we, and we want to talk, get a chance to talk to you. If, you're, if you want more information about Build to Rent or just, you know, to kind of, or if you're interested in the fund and you want to, Get some information, more information about this fund. We'll be glad to share some of this with you. And you're, again, you'll get a copy of this slide. This is Rob and, and I, this is, these are our Calendly links. You'll have access to our calendar, you know, schedule time to cost. We want to hear from you. We want to get some feedback on the presentation. We want to hear what you think about the strategy. We want to hear what you think about um, the fund that we're raising right now. To, and this fund is for build to rent. It's for multifamily. It's basically for housing. We want to get housing in the places where people need homes. And some of the housing we do is build to sell. A lot of it's build to rent. Some of it's um, apartment housing, affordable housing. It's just wherever, wherever the opportunity is there. Again, there's some disclaimers. Before we get into q and I want to show you at least some of the pictures. These are some of the build to sell projects. These are homes that we're building. And these are selling really well. These are basically selling a lifestyle. It's really nice. These homes, by the way, are, they're in the fours. Let's see, they're in the fours, 3,000 square foot homes. And, um, and then they get a little bit smaller. And I'm going to, on the, the next presentation we do, we're going to show you more, a lot more of our build to rent product. But I just wanted to show you a little bit of just some of the things we're building. And we'll also talk about some multifamily product. But the, again, you can actually take your, 
the camera on your smartphone, hold it over the screen right now and over that QR code and it'll pull up a link where you can schedule a calendar call with us. Um, I want to take some time to answer some questions. We got a couple minutes here. Everybody's done great. I appreciate you guys kind of hanging with us for a while. So there's a section in there. You should be, I don't know if you're familiar with Zoom, but you should be able to go in and um, ask questions. I'm not sure. I so if anybody else have any questions, um, and, and, and Rob, if there's anything you'd like to add, you know, you're welcome to do that. I know we haven't heard very much from you because I talk a lot. All right, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so guys, we're excited to launch, we're really excited about launching our first, um, this isn't our first fund, but this is our first build to rent fund, build to rent and, and multifamily fund combined. Again, uh, we wanna hear from you. We'll send this to you when we're done. We appreciate everyone's um, time spending with us. Uh, you're welcome to email us as well and ask us whatever questions. It sounds like we did a good job. We don't have any, or wait, do, I don't think we have any questions. We do or, have one question there, Adam. We do. What is the minimum, is investment? The minimum investment in our fund? This fund has a $100,000 minimum. Um, we'll have, yeah, so it's a $100,000 minimum for this fund. And um, some of our investors like to do direct investments. Typically, if they're investing 500000 or more, they can, direct investment means they, they maybe they just want to do build to rent or development, or they just want to do multifamily. You know, they just want to get into a specific project. But a lot of our investors really like to diversify across the whole portfolio. And again, if, uh, you know, if you're in interested, if you're interested in that uh, right now, where it's a uh, this particular fund's offering an eight percent preferred return, hundred thousand dollar minimum. It's you know, it's going to be a five year fund. And um, we're not charging f um, fees at the fund level. All our fees are going to be at the project level. So it's really going to be um, very low cost from there. And then a 60-40 split on the back, the back end. So again, we can, we'll send you these slides. We'll get you more of this information and share this with you. We're our target IR is about 25%. And that's going to be a blend and what, between our development projects and our multifamily projects. What, what I would say is if they've got an interest in any of this, give us a call, even if they're not going to interest in, in this particular fund, because sometimes we can connect them with people in the space or maybe they don't, they're not meeting the minimum. That's fine. We'd still love to connect with them, answer questions. Uh, you never know what will happen in two, three, five, ten 10 years. There may be something that comes from it. And if nothing, we still are happy to, to help and educate and, and share our insights and our thoughts. I talked to a guy today for half an hour who, you know, he's just buying his first rental property. Well, it may be years before he invests with us, but we're happy to talk with him and give some insight on, on what it takes to, to do that and how to structure the LLC. I spoke with him uh, in length about that and just making sure that he, he was trying to cross all his T's and dot all his I's. So we're, we're happy to talk with you and um, give you any support that you, that you need in order to succeed. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, guys, we love doing this. We love talking to with other investors and, and even new people in the business and sharing our experience and sharing what we, what we know. And I'm excited to work with a lot of people we are working with. So again, um, guys, we appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing, hearing from you, hearing from you. And, and, and that's it. That's the end of our presentation. We are going to do, we actually have five presentations total. So if you're interested, we'll, we'll get some emails out to you soon and, and talk about, I think the next one's probably going to be a little bit more um, around multifamily, but we really wanted, we really wanted to get this information out there on the bill to rent because it's been amazing what, what, what's been happening with that was just fantastic. So thank you everyone. I don't want to belabor it, uh, this, this, uh, this call nothing more that I dislike more than a, a, a length and unnecessarily length and meeting, but thank you very much for all of your, your time. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks thank so much. You.